So when trying to determine molecular shapes, where you always have to start is by determining the electron geometry around the central atom. And in doing electron geometry, we're going to treat every area of electrons exactly the same, whether it's a double bond, a single bond, a triple bond, a lone pair, all of those things would count as one area of electrons. And we'll modify that, we'll see later, as we look at molecular geometry, which then is when we consider whether that is a bond or whether it is a lone pair, and we look at the shape of the molecule overall. In electron geometries, we're just determining how many areas of electrons so we can find the base shape. And this all has to do with valence shell electron repulsion pair theory or Bessepper theory. That's where we get these different shapes of molecules. Fundamentally, this is because systems tend towards the low energy state. Let's take this very simple system here. I have this ball, it's on a ramp, and I've put this block in front of it. So this has a high potential energy due to the gravitational attraction to the ground. And this high potential energy state is unstable. So what would happen if I remove the block? Well, of course, we all know that if I remove the block, the system will tend towards the low energy state. The ball will roll down the hill, turning its potential energy into kinetic energy until it runs out of energy and stops because of the friction of the ground. We've talked about Coulombic attraction, electrostatic plus minus charge attraction. And when I have oppositely charged particles, the high energy state is being separated from each other. It's hard to keep two things which are attracted apart. Think Romeo and Juliet. So in this case, the low energy state is reached when these particles come together because there is an attractive force between them. But we're not dealing with oppositely charged particles, we're dealing with pairs of electrons and they're all negatively charged because all electrons have a negative charge. So in this case, I have identically charged particles. So I have a repulsive force pushing the charges apart. So in this case, the high energy state is putting these charges together and the low energy state is reducing the energy by pushing them apart. If we think about how this is going to work for molecules, if we tend towards the low energy state, molecules have the areas of electrons as far away from each other as possible in order to reduce the electron pair repulsion. So we're looking to make the largest bond angles that we possibly can given the number of areas of electrons. So let's think about a simple system here how we can control the position. We control the position by having them take the farthest apart positions, which produce the lowest potential energy. The electrons are attracted to the nucleus, and that means they can be moved around the nucleus and that whole area moves together. So it's kind of like spokes on a pivot. So let's think about what would happen if I had two electron pairs and I positioned them at 90 degrees to each other. Well, in this case, I can reach a greater bond angle. So these would push or repel each other and they would repel until they get as far apart as they possibly can which means they would get to be around an 180 degree angle. And since nothing is perfectly still, and really this one should be moving too, they would basically be staying right around that 180 angle. If they flex towards each other, the repulsion force pushes them away. If they flex towards each other this way, the repulsion force pushes them away. So two areas of electrons would naturally attain a 180 degree bond angle. Once we determine the electron geometry, then we'll think about molecular geometry. So we have six different electron geometries, which I've built for you with some balloons so that you can see them in three dimensions. And 
Your job is to make sure that you know all of these electron geometries and the bond angles involved in each one of these electron geometries. For one area of electrons, I didn't actually make a balloon model for this because it would be blowing up a balloon and putting it on the backdrop. So one area of electrons would be something like HBr or a diatomic element where there's just one bond in between the two elements. And that means that always has to be a linear molecule, which means you have 180 degrees. Uh, there's only really one way to connect two things together. You draw a line between them. So it's always linear and 180 degrees if you only have one area of electrons. So remember when you're looking at the electron geometry, you're always looking around the center atom. So you can kind of think about that as the knot there where the balloons are tied together. This would be my circumstance where I have two areas of electrons around the center atom, whether those are bonds or whether those are lone pairs. And you can see that if you're trying to get these things as far apart from each other as they possibly can, the biggest angle I could make between the light blue and the dark blue is a straight line or 180 degrees. That's why this is a linear electron geometry. Two areas of electrons around the center is going to be a linear molecule with a 180 degree angle between the two sides. Now I have three areas of electrons tied around my center here. And again, I want to have all of these electron areas as far away from each other as possible to minimize the energy of repulsion. And so in this case now, I can have a 120 degree angle between each one, and this would be a trigonal planar electron geometry. Remember right now, all I'm thinking about is areas of electrons. I'm not thinking about whether those areas are lone pairs or bonds. We're treating them all exactly the same when we do the electron geometry. In this situation where I have three areas of electrons around the center atom, for example, in something like formaldehyde or ozone or boron trifluoride, that electron geometry is going to be trigonal planar. The molecular geometry may be different. I'm going to have to look at that, but the electron geometry is trigonal planar. The bond angle here is 120 degrees between each of these areas of electrons. So this is our first three-dimensional shape where I go from having three areas of electrons to having four areas of electrons. And rather than what you would think, which is that this would be a square, you can get a larger bond angle by making this into a three-dimensional shape. So this is actually a tetrahedral electron geometry and the angles are 109.5 degrees between each one of these areas of electrons. With four areas of electrons, we actually turn into a three-dimensional shape where linear and trigonal planar were flat. This is a 3D shape. That's because if it were flat, the maximum angle would be 90 degrees. It would be a square. But if I get it into 3D, I have a tetrahedral electron geometry. And the bond angles here are all approximately 109.5. And if you remember from first year, the molecular geometry of all of these molecules is different, even though they are based on the tetrahedral electron geometry. And what we'll be doing in class is discussing the different elect molecular geometries that go with these electron geometries. So this is one angle on a five electron center geometry so that you can see what it looks like around the plane. And that's those dark blue balloons. In the plane, it looks like it's trigonal planar with an added up and down portion. So this is actually called a trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. It's trigonal bipyramidal because if you look at it straight on, 
like this, you can see how it would make a triangular pyramid. And since there's one on the top and one on the bottom, it's trigonal bipyramidal. So here we have another three-dimensional structure with five areas of electrons. You get what's called a trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. And the molecular geometries for these become fairly complex. All of these examples, if you draw the Lewis structure, will have five areas of electrons around their center. And in this case, if you look at it, if you look head on, you can see the trigonal here is the plane where you have a 120 degree angle. The bipyramidal is because you have the light blue balloons coming up out of the plane and down behind the plane. And so in this case, you have a couple of bond angles. You have a 120 degree angle in the plane with the dark blues. You also have a 90 degree angle from the light blue to the dark blue. And the bottom of the dark blue. And you can actually look at the entire bond angle here from top to bottom, and that would be 180 degrees. So here's one angle on a six electron area geometry. These would have, of course, an expanded octet. And this is an octahedral geometry. You can see the four light blue electrons areas are in the plane, making a square. And then as you turn it right side up, so you can see the entire geometry, you can see that there are two areas, one going up and one going down. That means that in space, this is an octahedral shape. And in fact, all of these bond angles are going to be the same. They're all going to be 90 degrees because it's a 90 degree from the dark blue balloon to the light blue balloon. And then each one of the light blue is in a square or a 90 degree angle. Again, with six areas of electrons, we have an electron geometry that is octahedral. And when you look at these, you'll see that there are a different number of bonds in each one, so the molecular geometry will be different. But the electron geometry for six areas is always octahedral. And all of these angles then are 90 degrees because these light blue balloons make a square in the plane and then there's the 90 degree angle between the plane and the balloon on the top and the balloon on the bottom and a 180 degree angle if I go from blue balloon dark blue balloon to dark blue balloon so it's not all 90 degrees except for the 180 here between the top and the bottom so just to sum up, everything we've been discussing is about electron geometries. We're just counting the number of bonds, single, double, triple, all counts as one area, and lone pairs, just the number of areas of electrons around the center. That determines the electron geometry. Then we're going to use that to find the molecular geometry by looking at the angles formed by the atoms and the lone pairs. So I would suggest have some space, maybe make a little chart, have your electron geometries, and then we will discuss what happens to the molecular geometry when you consider the number of bonds and lone pairs on each type of shape.